I now call order the regular session meeting of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs on Tuesday, May 5th, 2015 at 6.30. Roll call. Mayor Archie. Here. Vice Mayor Larson. Here. Commissioner Terrapani. Here. Commissioner Banther. Here. Commissioner Sieber. Here. Uh, tonight's invocation will be given by Reverend Jack Long of Regional Medical Center. Bearing that point, will everyone stand? Please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance followers. Heavenly Father, how great we, for we are for your kindness to us. You are good in spite of our faults and failures. We are so undeserving, but you, you are so gracious. Tonight, our community faces many challenges, needs, even fears, and we look to you for help. Lord, help us to face them honestly, cooperatively, in the spirit of unity. Lord, would fairness and love fill our hearts. We thank you for those who serve us, those who help us. We pray for Mayor Archie, for all the commissioners, all who minister here as servants of yours. Keep those safe who keep us safe. And Lord, we pray that you would bless our city, our state, and our nation as we humbly serve you. This we pray in your holy name. Amen. Now go to uh, public comments on any item that will not be discussed this evening. Hey, do you have something, sir? Uh, you have to come and up and state your name and address for the record. Just want to mention, I raised my right hand. 701 East Tarpon Avenue, Tarpon Springs, Florida, United States of America, the Honorable Thomas B. Dobie's undertaker. Today, I don't know if the board heard this, that Ken Ennis passed away. He was fire chief here from 1968 to 1989. I believe that's 21 years uh, that he served our city here. So I just wanted to bring it to your board. I didn't know if you all knew that or not. Thank you very much. Signing off. Thank you, sir. Are there any other public comments? Seeing none, we'll go to proclamations. The first one is uh, Peace Officers Memorial Day. <clears throat> this proclamation reads, whereas Congress and the President of the United States have designated May 15 as Peace Officers Memorial Day and the week in which it falls as Police Week, uh, and whereas the Tarpon Spain Police Department and all law enforcement agencies play an essential role in safeguarding the rights and freedoms of our <coughs> citizens and visitors, whereas it is important for all citizens to know and understand the duties and responsibilities of the police department and that our police officers recognize their duty to safeguard life, property, and protect against violence and disorder and whereas Tarpon Springs and its residents and businesses wish to honor the service and sacrifice of all law enforcement officers, particularly those killed in the line of duty while protecting and safeguarding our nation's community, especially our own officer Charles Condack. Now, therefore, I, David O'Archie, by virtue of the authority vested in me as the mayor of the city of Tarpon Springs, do hereby proclaim May 15, 2015, as Peace Officers Memorial Day. And uh, Chief.
Honorable Mayor, Commissioners, may I say a few words? Um, this is a very difficult time for us, um, obviously, with, with what happened to Officer Kondak and his, his wife, Teresa, and his daughter here in the audience tonight. Um, in 1962, President John F. Kennedy signed a proclamation which designated May 15th as Peace Officers Memorial Day and the week in which that day follows as Police Week. Um, we were just in Tallahassee this weekend uh, for the state's annual ceremonies. It was very nice. Um, they did it right, um, but it was also very touching and very heartfelt, uh, even more so that we just went through this and this family's still going through it. Um, some interesting statistics about police officers. There are roughly 900,000 law enforcement officers in the United States. Since the first recorded line of duty death in 1791, over 20,000 police officers have been killed in the line of duty. On average, a police officer in the United States is killed every 58 hours. Over the last decade, there have been close to 60,000 assaults on police officers, resulting in over 15,000 injuries. In Florida, there have been 783 police officers killed in the line of duty. In the United States, there have been over 20,000 police officers killed in the line of duty. Tarpon Springs Police Department has lost five officers in the line of duty, going back to Marshall Whitehurst. Uh, the official records show four, but since Marshall Whitehurst was actually hired by the city and he was deputized by the Hillsborough Sheriff, we also have him on our wall. And, and obviously, you know, the most recent tragedy we had, Officer Kondak. Um, in, in closing, when, when you wear this badge and gun every day, you put it on the line. We all know that. Um, I, I believe that we are facing a very challenging and difficult time in our profession. Um, with what's going on around the nation. Well, I've been doing this for over 26 years, and, and I know this profession, and I know the men and women in it, and I know we'll rise above it, and we'll continue to serve our communities with uh, honor and distinction. Thank you. Thank you. Any uh, public comments on this item? Uh, <clears throat> we can just let the uh, record reflect that there's a proclamation for all American a uh, month um, is to be mailed. But we have another one, um, National Safe Boating Week. <clears throat> this proclamation reads, see the Tarpon Springs, Florida, whereas on average 700 people die each year in boating related accidents. In the U.S., approximately 70% of these fatalities caused by drowning, whereas the vast majority of these accidents are caused by human error or poor judgment and not by the boat, equipment or environmental factors. And whereas a significant number of boaters who lose their lives by drowning each year would be alive today if they wore, had worn their life jackets. And whereas today's life jackets are more comfortable, more attractive, and more wearable than styles of years past and deserve a fresh look by today's boating public. Now therefore I, David Archer, by do hereby support the goals of the North American Safe Boating Campaign and proclaim May 16th through 22nd, 2015 as National Safe Boating Week and the start of the year-round effort to promote safe boating. And I urge all those who boat to wear it and practice safe boating habits. And uh, we have the U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary here. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Rich Michio, and uh, I'm the, the commander of uh, Tarpon Springs Flotilla 11-9, United States Coast Guard Auxiliary. 
Uh, our mission is uh, to spread the word of safe boating to the general public. We hold classes uh, monthly. Uh, we do vessel examinations. Um, we just promote safe boating uh, in our waters because we all know you see it on TV all the time. People go out and they don't come back or they get lost and we have to go out and uh, in conjunction with the United States Coast Guard, we'll do search patterns and try to find these people and most times we are very successful. Um, we support the uh, United States Coast Guard uh, Air Station Clearwater and also uh, Station Sand Key in their activities. Uh, we'll, we'll play with them as far as uh, being training vessels and, uh, and they'll do uh, C-130 drops out of aircraft and, and we'll pick up the remains. So um, well, our flotilla is very active and um, we just, we lost uh, one of our members, uh, Roy Warner, uh, back on February 12th of this year. Um, he was uh, as far up, he had 20 years in the Coast Guard Auxiliary and um, he was as high, went as high as uh, uh, district, uh, I'm sorry, division commander. So he had uh, six flotillas under his, uh, under his charge at one time. So, but um, he's usually here for this and this year he's not. So we're gonna carry on and um, we're gonna just keep, try to keep Tarpon Springs uh, safe waters. Okay, thank you. Thank you for all y'all do. Are uh, any public comments on this item? Also, we have uh, a proclamation for Civility Month that we will also mail. Um, now we go to presentations, and uh, the first is Florida Hospital North Pinellas. Mr. Berg. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Vice Mayor, uh, Commissioners, Chief, thank you for allowing me to come. My name is Bruce Burgum, and I have the privilege and honor to be the President and CEO of Florida Hospital North Pinellas right here in, in town, uh, 1395 South Pinellas Drive. So tonight um, I stand here to recognize a hero. Um, our mission at uh, Florida Hospital North Pinellas is to extend the healing ministry of Christ, not only inside our hospital, but also in the community that we serve. We appreciate being added to the agenda tonight. In December of 2014, Tarpon Springs community lost a hero, a 17-year veteran officer who was transported to our hospital after being shot in the line of duty. Our entire Florida hospital family and caregivers at the hospital were deeply affected by this tremendous loss. As caregivers, we are always here to serve. As law enforcement officers, um, on a daily basis, you are willing to risk your lives uh, to serve and protect. And we thank you for your commitment and your service. As part of the Tarpon Springs community, we stand united with the Tarpon Springs Police Department in offering our deepest sympathy to Officer Condick's wife, Teresa, and family. At this moment, I would like to call up Teresa and her family, as well as the Tarpon Springs Police Department.
when Florida Hospital approached us on this, um, we were looking to do uh, something for our officers in remembrance and honor of Charlie. Um, so with this money, we're, we're going to match it and we're going to do something really nice inside the police department in honor of Charlie, something that will benefit the officers. So that project's being worked on right now conceptually, so we're going to you know, move forward. But thank you very much for all that you did for the family and the, host and, and the police department. Thank you. And I'd like to just take this opportunity to thank Mr. Uh, Burgum and uh, Florida Hospital North Pinellas for continuing to show uh, that you are co uh, truly a community partner and that you care about the loss, the loss that all of us suffered as far as uh, with Teresa and the Condac family and showing that type of support uh, to them and to our uh, police officers. I just say thank you uh, first to you and all of those that uh, 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 working for uh, Florida uh, Hospital of North Vanilla. So, yes, sir. If I may, one more time. Um, when I spoke in Pasco County, um, it was uh, last Friday for their dedication and they honored Charlie. I called Teresa my hero at the speech. Can we all give her a round of applause? Public comments on this item. Seeing, oh, Mr. Dobis. Do I have to give my address again? 701 East Tarpon Avenue, Honorable Thomas B. Dobies. I've been trying to compose a letter to thank Chief and the entire police department of Tarpon Springs for what they did. I'm sorry. Um, this is something that a funeral director never wants to do, is to bury someone that he knows that's a police officer that has supported the community the way he did. Um, I was talking with Teresa today, and you know we all love you, Teresa, and we're there for you. And I just want to commend the police department. CEO Bruce. Or you're the owner of the hospital now, I believe, aren't you? Good, I'll vote for you. For what you're doing and what you do for the community and giving back. Sergeant Miller, who has been there through thick and thin, thick and thin, you can tell I'm, I haven't been drinking either, so. But, and Jeff and all the other staff that have been there for Teresa and Teresa's family that we, we all love and will continue to support. Last week I named a dog after Charlie at Newport Ritchie. It's named Charlie K. And the first dog they got was so mean they had to get rid of it. So I told the city, I said, we got to get a little bit more milder dog. That would be more. So now we have a Charlie K in Newport, Richie. And, and I just want to thank you all for the opportunity to say a few words, Mr. Mayor, and being born and raised here. And I was born at Helen Ellis Hospital. And if I ever get sick and you see me, I'm going to be crawling to Helen Ellis. You better pick me up, OK? Well, that's, that's uh, you know, I stayed composed, but I just commend the city chief all of your officers, the support that we had. Thank you. And I'm not running for mayor, Chris Alahousis. That's what he's saying. Uh, was there any public comments? Seeing none, um, we'll go to uh, presentation, general fund budget update. Mr. Harris. Good evening, Ron Herring, Finance Director. What we have here is a second quarter update as of March, 5th, March 31st, 2015 for the general fund. <coughs> uh, this first slide is one you've probably seen before. We had it on the first update. It's showing the perspective of the unassigned fund balance as of September 2014. You know, the 2008 through the 2013 numbers were the final audited numbers at that time. 2014 and 15 were the projections that were done at that time with a decrease of 651,000 and a decrease of 502,000, leaving a projected unassigned fund balance of 2015 of 8,024,271. 
Now we've done a more current perspective of the unassigned fund balance as of March 31st, 2015. 2008 through 2014 are now the audited final numbers. 2014 coming in at 8,872,797. 2015 is a projected number as of March 31st, 2015 with a decrease of 54,916, leaving a unassigned fund balance of 8,817,881. And this next slide shows the detail of what makes up that projection of the 8,817,881, beginning with the beginning fund balance of 8,872,797, plus some projected revenue adjustments of utility tax, about 36,000, franchise fees for electric, 23,000, half cent sales tax projected to increase 44,000, and building permits, 20,000. and. The one thing that's gone down consistently is in the only one, so you know, this year and last year was a communication service tax going down 53,550 for total revenue adjustments of 70,990, a positive. And then we have some salary and benefit increases that we need to take into account of a negative 125,906. You know, the net adjustment is the 70,990 revenue adjustments minus the salary and benefit increases of 125,906 for the net decrease of 54,916, leaving the projected unassigned fund balance at March 31st, 2015 of 8,817,881. And like I say, this is a projected number right now. Things can change, but that's what we project right now is March 31st, 2015. And that's the end of this presentation. I'm here for any questions. I don't have any questions, but I just want to thank you uh, and all of your staff for a continuous uh, update and keeping us informed as to where we're at with the budget. So, uh, any questions, comments? Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, I guess B is Penny for Vanilla's budget update. We wanted to do a penny update on the for fiscal year 2015, the local option sales tax, a penny budget. And this first screen, it might be a little bit hard to read. I hope you have the, maybe the handouts. I got some extra ones if you have them. But this was the budget for the penny fund that was uh, presented and approved back in September. It shows that at the top of the report is the uh, beginning working capital fund balance plus the revenue projections giving us the total sources, and then it gets into the expenditures in categories of general government, public safety, transportation, culture, and recreation for the total expenditures. And then the last important line is what money is left over for the ending fund balance, or if they want to call it the ending working capital projected. And this was the part of the CIP that was projected back in the 2015 budget for, fiscal, for years 2015, 16, 17, 18, and 19. Like I could say this was the approved budget back in September when it was pr approved for the penny fund. This is ba the same slide in the same format, but now we've had some uh, some changes. We had some items that were not spent last year, but they were encumbered. And some of those are in red. Those are the ones that were encumbered that were brought forward by resolution 2014-38 in December, those were you know, encumbered and the budget resolution brought over the budget for those, those are in red. The ones in blue are some uh, changes to the budget that have things that have come up that we'd like to get into the budget here. They include uh, 60,000 for air conditioning at the old PD department, uh, radios for the police and fire of 466,921, uh, police communication CAD system of 160,000. Uh, the balance of 150,000 is going to come out of the police impact fund. Um, the other thing is Martin Luther King lighting and streetscape for 220,000, and Sunset Beach dredging for 150,000. And with all those changes, we still have the positive numbers in the bottom there along the fund balance. Not like I say, I don't know if you can read them up there. If you can't, I can read them off for you. But 
And again, one of the main reasons we wanted to present this to you tonight, um, usually this document would have been in the budget process. We'd have been going over and talking the budget. But there's necessities of some of these projects going forward now. In fact, one of them's on the agenda tonight, the ability to kind of match the funds that they have in police impact fees for a very important upgrade of CAD as we've talked about policing and what's going on. It is imperative that we come with the latest technologies of knowledge for these police officers and their safety. Again, and that's something the chief will talk about, but that's one of the things you'll be seeing on the near future. The radio ones is another important thing. Um, that's not going to be tonight, but you're going to be seeing it in, within the next couple meetings. The technology of our radios is out. They will no longer be replacing the parts and stuff. So it, we think it's time, and we want to be able to show you and because we may have an opportunity to save, and again, the presentation will tell you, but we're, we may have the ability by now to sub save a substantial amount of money from that cost that you, the cost you see will, will be saving a substantial amount of money um, if we buy them now, um, as opposed to waiting to after the budget year. So those two are the things that are coming up that we'll be talking about. So we wanted to show you this and how it affects in the near term next year to combine this year and next year. But again, this lays out the rest of the penny for Pinellas. The issue of the MLK lighting, that's another thing you're going to be seeing sooner than later. But let me emphasize that the emphasis on that project I began by starting replacing the, the lights, which have been, you know, a tremendous problem. They've, they've outworn, they're used, they have to be replaced. Um, but as we were looking at it in replacing them, we just needed to put a whole new system in. And if we're going and going in to put a whole new system in, we have been doing so good at our streetscapes and entrances in the city, we wanted to combine with a future project that you were going to see next year and have a whole streetscape of that entrance way in the community, a Union Academy streetscape, the new lights, um, better pedestrian walkways, and that sort of things. And let me emphasize that that project um, the moving up of that is is caused by, if you see just up above it, the LNR Boulevard, the LNR Boulevard construction, which is the road by the power plant. If you see that number in red there, um, that is the money we're going to save because that was projected in the 800,000 area being done. We are almost, we still got a little contingency, but it looks like we're going to come up with almost the exact figure for the MLK lighting um, from that project. So really that project going to, to six instead of the eights, um, that's the 200 and some thousand to go ahead and do it right, do the lights, do the streetscape, and, and make a get entrance way. Again, that's going to be coming down the line, but with that money available, we'd like to do that sooner or later. The last one that hopefully we'll see in tune, we've probably been working four to five years to get through all the processes to be able to do dredging at Sunset Beat for that boat ramp and make a boat ramp that is slowly year by year turning into somewhere that we won't be able to launch boats from. And I think we're at the end of the road with all the environmental people and said, in fact, we're out to design with their blessing now. Um, we won't know the actual cost. The cost of 150, you see, is an estimate. Um, we won't know that till the design is done. But finally, after four or five years of working, we may be at that, and that'll allow a lot better for anyone who boats or tries to launch at Sunset Beach. Um, hopefully we'll put a project together and approval um, to greatly improve that. So all these things are going to be breaking the last six months of this budget year. So instead of the budget time, we wanted to show you, we wanted to show you the layout of them. We're gonna, we want to show you how the money works. There's still room for other projects. Um, and again, if, th if this penny money keeps coming in and everything within the next year or two, you know, we even think this money may increase, there may be increases in that because right now everything's on the upward swing. So, so I'm not worried this, these additions will affect no projects that we have now. And I don't think, I don't see any hampering in some projects we may need to do in the future, especially if we can keep um, that taken from the reserves down as we've been seeing, if that upturn keeps going. So again, we, we need to show you this tonight because one of those items you're going to see and be talked about in a later item. So we wanted to show this to you and show you where we are now. Um, again, you would have probably seen it within a month or two at the budget time, but we need to bring it forward because we can start going and getting some of those projects going now. Um, so that's the necessity of bringing that forward for you to see now. Thank you. Any uh, questions for Mr. Heron or Ms. Corey? Uh, Mr. Carpenter. 
Thank you. Um, let me just first say that I don't necessarily have an issue with, with anything that's being <clears throat> presented tonight. I do have some questions, however. Um, and I do think that our penny, penny money is something that we should really uh, look closely at in terms of how we spend it um, as far as throughout the community for public safety, um, transportation, and also looking at a lot of our infrastructure projects that we can utilize this money for. Um, there are some some projects that I have noted that we have continuously pushed back, and I understand that that's been for various reasons, you know, whether something comes up or we try and piggyback it with another project and it just uh, logistically works out better um, if we move it. Um, so some of the things that I, that I have noted that I have questions for is the, um, the city marina improvements. I noted on the first slide uh, when, when it was presented, when, when the penny money was presented, it was for 135000 and now it's down to 102,000. Um, is there, what's the reason for that, Mr. Herring? I believe that's the in-house the, the in work that we're gonna be doing for it. I, I believe that's the thing, and that's kind of some of the hold up with that project. We've been trying to do a lot of stuff in-house so these prices on there would go down. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that savings is an in-house, and I think we're ready to go within the next month or so. Um, we should be ready to go with that project. I think we got the dredging just about to do the, the dredging portion, the slips that are, are unusable now and on the building and what we're gonna do. I think we're real close to going on that. That's something that I, I know for certain since I've been on this board in the last four years that that's been a project that's been slated for many years now and, and we've still yet to realize. Um, and just on that note, I, I see where it says items brought over from fiscal year 2014 and budget, re budget resolution are in red. Well, that's not in red. Why is that? It's not, no, it was brought over. It was in the budget there. Right. It, but it's but it was from 2014, it was in the budget and items from 2014 that were in the budget that uh, were slated but not realized are in red and that one is not. <clears throat> okay, I'm sorry, I was As trying is, to find I believe, it <laughs> um, the Hope Athens Street pedestrian improvements, the 300,000 I know has been slated for a couple years and continuously gets moved back. I understand that part of that is due to, you know, the route that we went with the uh, sponge dock improvements and you were trying to piggyback that. But again, that's also uh, something that I know we've pushed back and I don't think it's, it's right to continue to push that back to 2016. So for me, that's something you know, that's important that we've, we've told the residents for, for many years that that's gonna be done um, and it's now it's pushed back to 2016. So for me, that's something that's important to. I think it's the same, really it's the same because w the always intention was <coughs> to do that after the sponge docks project is complete, which hopefully we're gonna be completed by July, August, and then picking up in the 16 year, which is that October and after, that's when we pick up and, and go next with that project. And I don't necessarily have a problem with that. My recollection is that $300,000 was slated prior to the sponge dock improvement plan. Mm -hmm. uh, it was always meant to go after that. It was done when, 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 the, when the one pro when the major sponge dock project moved back a year, that one moved back a year. Mm -hmm. so, so again, so you wouldn't have all of everything torn up that way and this way together. No, they, I understand. They, they, they I mean, moved, that makes sense. Yeah, they moved together. And, and we did do it, if you'll note it, we did, because of that move, you see, that's why, that's one of the reasons we did the addition of that first block of Athens with the lights and what you're gonna be seeing, I think they're mobilized now to do. Mm -hmm. We did add in that first block of Athens, which would have been in this, in this second section. Um, we were able to add with the cost savings and not doing some of the other things, we were able to add that one block up the cross street into the, that got moved, that portion got moved into the first phase of the docks. So really a portion of the Athens Street and, and Hope Project got moved into the uh, first project. So we'll already have that first block of Athens complete and then we'll go on from there and you know we'll be ready to design that and bid that at the first of the budget year in, in October. And, you know, because hopefully, hopefully within 60 to 90 days we're gonna be finished with the other project mm -hmm. and then we'll be ready to move to that one. And then moving to the uh, north portion, North Safford Recreation Corridor, 104,000. What was that for? It's on the second page in the red towards the bottom. What portion of that that was moved, that was, that was the one moved back? What section was that for? I'm trying to remember. 
I'm not sure I can find out and get back to you. Okay, that, that's in the red, so that says something that was brought over from 2014. I thought we were relatively finished with the uh, North Safford uh, and Live Oak Recreation Corridor. So I don't think we encumbered one part, the last portion of it. I don't think we encumbered it after October 1. That's why it had to be moved into, into this one. Right, but what is the project to be completed then? What are the funds for? I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. I can't remember what that last portion of, of funding. It's something we've already done, I believe. We're, we're finished with it. Um, I just can't remember what it is offhand. And then the Dorset Park Tennis Courts, is $12,000 sufficient funds for a project like that? We, we've completed that one. Okay. Yeah, some of these are completed and right, they've already been completed, but and again, that was the sinkhole, that was the problem with the sinkhole. If they're completed, then why are we showing them? Because they were in this, they were in this penny budget. They're in this penny budget for this. This is this year. Right. This is this, is this year. So this is 2015. You, you've got a lot of these things done or bought or, or okay. set yet. I follow. That was just showing we, 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 and again, that was because we didn't get started in encumber till, till after, uh, you know, after October. So it's in, it's in this one. But we, there's nothing out. Everything in here is, some of it's done, some of it's ongoing, mm -hmm. some of it's close to done. But that is your actual budget for it this current year. Yeah, that's your, end of 2014. What is, is budget and stuff. Right. And can, if I could ask your Marina question there, that sure. I think what that is, the things in red, those are the ones that actually had a purchase order and they were encumbered. Mm -hmm. The Marina wasn't. So that since it wasn't encumbered, it didn't come over in the budget resolution. So we had to just add it into the budget again for the next year for, for the Marina. And then in terms of the money going from 135 to 102, that relates to what Mark said in terms of doing some in-house work? Yes, and I think part, part of what's been used already is they were starting some engineering on that. I can't remember, I think it was 25,000 to start the engineering for the marina. Okay. Um, Chief, the communication CAD, um, when you and I talked, that was like a, a match with the police impact? Correct. For 250,000 total, it was uh, 257. There's another component to it, uh -huh. um, which which includes the cars. We have purchasing work on that. We have to come back to you on that one. Okay, so, so it's a little bit more money than the. It's, it's about 310,000, but we want to take 150 out of impact. Yep. That's what it's for, and then the rest of the money coming out of uh, local option sales. This is going to be item 18 tonight. Right. Yeah, that's what I was. Yeah. That's what I was getting at because I, when you and I talked, I thought it was around 250, and the, the numbers make more sense at 310, which is what you're. Right, saying. with the other project that's uh -huh. come back to you. Right. Um, this is just a presentation tonight, right? This is not something that we're looking to approve. It, well, all these individual ones you'll see is going to come back to you. Right. The, man, okay, all the ones you see that are new and stuff, that's going to come back to you. We just give it tonight because you're going to see the first one of them come to you tonight. So that's, why, that's why you're seeing it. Now. The other ones will be coming back before you. I'm all set, Mr. Uh, <clears throat> yes, I question that uh, Athens improvements uh, being done also and talked to Mr. Function and he said it was going to be in phase three of the uh, dock improvement project. Is that correct? I think I kind, of talk, I kind of think about what you call the phases. If you call this phase, phase two that's coming now, I still call it all phase one, just a two, okay. but really if, if you consider the first things we did one, this one starting now, two, and then that one next. Do you know when that would be? or? Um, we can start as soon as it's done. I mean, we'll you know we'll start planning that. Um, you know, any time you know even before October, we can start planning that. That's going to take that's going to take some uh, planning. So we'll probably start that right afterwards. You know, September because we really got limited right away on Athens. So we really got to be creative on Athens and hope because we've got we've already know we got limitations with some very little right away and stuff. But you know. We'll be starting on that right when that project, when we get the other one signed off and done, then that'll be the next thing thing we'll do. But again, we, we were able to get the jump on the first block and, and move mm -hmm. that into this project to get that first bl block Athens to show. Now again, as we go further down Athens, our right away just shortens that. We have the luxury that was the, the best place to have there. We continue the light plan that we had in the rest of the docks. We have some challenges going down Athens and going down Hope. Yeah, um, I can just see that. we have no rights. We have very little rights away, but we're going to be creative and do something nice to have that as two corridors, the two corridors coming in, and with the different historical amenities along both of them and stuff. You know, we'll bring back brainstorm, have community meetings down there and stuff to brainstorm what we can do to make those two corridors going in match up with uh, you know what we've done at the docks. 
and I'm also anxious to see the marina project. Um, I've walked down there and noticed it's almost full. The, the slips are, are, are being used. So yeah, again, a part of that, those, very those, important those, that, we get that those slips completed. that are can't be used because of that we've got, you know, again, the permitting is time consuming to do even a, a few little slips to do it. But that dredging work, I mean, we'll have that and we'll have the additional slips, you know, what to do with to go along with the amenities of the uh, building and stuff that we're doing. We'll have all that ready to go. Um, kind of in line and uh, going along as we go, as we're doing the end of the sponge, that, that, that work will be starting and going on kind of, you know, almost simultaneously, although we got this other project kicked off early so we can try to try to get it done, you know, in the July area so we can be prepared for some of the events coming up. So right. as long, long as there's no rainy season or disruption of weather or natural things, um, our contractor is confident we're going to knock that thing out. So. Um, little disruption to the docks as possible, so fingers crossed. Any additional questions? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, sir, for the update. Okay, thank you. Uh, item number seven is RO facility project <laughs> status update. What are you looking for? Oh, yes, sir. Sorry it. about that, uh, no, sir. Right. That's the light <laughs> right in your face. Good evening, Peter Delax, 514 Ashland Avenue. Uh, I wasn't really going to even talk about this. I know it's a presentation, but one thing did uh, catch my eye on the last two pages. Uh, on the second to the last page under transportation, under Mears Boulevard construction in 2017, there's two million dollars uh, appropriated or planned to be appropriated at that time, yet in the revised one, uh, that two million is gone. So uh, as a curious citizen, I'm just curious is, I know the lawsuit with the hospital and the developers is done, so either the developers are going to come in and finish building the road for us, or somehow we've decided not to build it. Is there some information you can share about us, about the Mears yeah, Boulevard? Yeah, that money, that money, and although we put it in the 17, I think when we made the presentation, we just wanted a placeholder that if everything fell apart and went awry and it came to the situation where we were going to have to do Mears, that we had it somewhere before the penny ends. Obviously, we're hoping it gets renewed into that for another 10 years, but until then, this is a placeholder. Um, now that the law suit is settled, and we've got people to come into us to pick up the project again. We, we no longer saw that um, as the need for a placeholder because the project did not go completely defunct, out, gone, and starting all over again. Um, everything's resolved now, and people are coming to us to try to revive the project, put some things in, and we very much hope within the next month or so that we'll be bringing some plans forward to uh, do that and get back going with uh, the Mears project, and which obviously they can't get a CO and anything else until they do the road. So we didn't feel with all the developments of the time that we needed that placeholder for that money on the thing that the things completely can put and done and out. Um, there was somewhere before the penny ended that we were gonna have to, we were gonna have to build mirrors if, if that went apart. And, and you know, those worries are, are not in our mind anymore. So well, I, I thank you for sharing that because uh, to me, and I know to a lot of people, uh, the completion of mirrors and uh, also the small little extension of distant over the hill <laughs> uh, would greatly increase the traffic efficiency, the flow of people in and around Tarpon. Uh, as I said before, I think it opens up a door to St. Pete College for people just north of there to be able to just get right down to the college. And uh, I'm sure the police department and any of their track efficiency studies would show how uh, helpful that would be instead of them having to go down curlew <laughs> distant to Klosterman or having to go all the way north to get around MLK when they, you know, could just have a straight shot through. So thank you for making sure that somewhere it's still going to be there. Thank you.
Any additional comments? Seeing none, we go to our number seven RO facility project status update. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm Bob Robertson, Public Services Program Manager, and I'm here tonight to provide a five minute status update on the alternative water supply project. Um, I sound wrong now with that, the RO plant, um, which I'd like to do monthly going forward. And within this update, I'll briefly highlight three of the water project items that are on your consent agenda tonight. So in four words, we are almost done. All the major structures and equipment are installed at the RO plant. All the wells are drilled and the plant is connected to 11 of the 15 raw water supply wells. The remaining four wells will be connected to the system once we complete a permitting review process with FDOT for a pipeline crossing. Uh, now we're in good shape with having these 11 wells connected because they will provide enough water to demonstrate that the facility can meet its design capacity of 5 MGD, which will establish what we call substantial completion. Our goal is to reach substantial completion on or before June 30th in order to be able to request the full amount of the Swift Mud reimbursement request, and that's our top priority. Item 15 on your consent agenda tonight is a change order to the Wharton Smith construction contract to extend their schedule to this June 30th target date. This is a $0 change order uh, addressing schedule only and the budget remains unchanged. Also our backup power generator is scheduled to be delivered this month. As you may recall, this is a clean emission diesel generator uh, known as a tier four generator and according to Duke Energy, uh, it's only the second of its kind in Pinellas County. This was a direct purchase by the city in the RO construction fund and due to its specialty nature, we're requesting a relatively small change order in the contract with the supplier under tonight's consent agenda number 13, item 13. And this will provide, uh, this will cover a portion of the cost um, for the specialty installation of this generator. Next, I'm pleased to report that the drilling of the deep injection well, which we'll use for the discharge of the RO concentrate, has been successfully completed, and preliminary testing indicates that this well will meet its design intent for the injection of RO concentrate. This means that the surface water discharge to the Duke Energy Canal will now serve as our backup for uh, discharge of RO concentrate, which is great. Uh, pipeline construction to connect the RO plant to the injection well is ongoing and it's about 50% complete with another major portion, another 40% of that scheduled to be completed by directional drilling later this week. Um, electrical work and SCADA integration and testing for that injection well is also forthcoming pending approval of consent agenda item number 10 tonight, which is a change order to the existing contract with our injection well driller. Um, this change order does increase the purchase order amount, but the total cost will remain underneath the board approved contract limit. Thanks to some savings we were able to achieve earlier in the project by not having to drill the well quite as deep as we originally anticipated. I wanna add that the success of this injection well is very fortunate and timely because although the pipeline work is completed that connects the RO plant to the Duke Energy Canal for that surface water discharge, the permit to complete the subsurface construction, that's the, the pipeline being installed below the water line up there at the canal, has been delayed by a slow permitting process, a permitting review process from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers for almost a year. Um, we've made every effort to expedite that process but, with them, but we're still, <coughs> we're still waiting on that permit. So we're fortunate to have the injection well nearly complete. Um, next, the extension of LNR Industrial Boulevard, which is the roadway in front of the RO plant, is another important project element since all the major piping that will connect the RO plant to the system will be installed in that corridor. About 90% of that pipeline work is completed now uh, with the roadway work slated to begin later this summer. But that's pending some a relocation of some existing power lines in that corridor. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, we are targeting substantial completion by June 30th. After June 30th, we'll be working to finalize punch list items with the contractor at the facility, complete the connection of those final four raw water production wells, complete that subsurface construction at the Duke Energy Canal, um, and complete training and optimization of the RO system operations. We will be making water intermittently through the summer as we learn, test, and optimize the operation of the plant, and we expect to be fully online by the end of the summer. Um, 
I thank you for your time, and I'd be glad to answer any questions. Well, thank you for the uh, thorough report and keeping us informed as yes, to where you're at. Any uh, questions? Thank you, sir. Thank you. And again, probably the beginning of uh, each month at the first meeting, he'll continue to give the updates until we're set, ready, and operating. Five minute, five minute limit, right, sir? <laughs> Uh, next, we'll have our consent. Uh, any public comments on this item? Pier de Lacus, 514 Ashland Avenue. Commissioner Terrapani, if you thought you had to wait for the marina, this has been going on what? almost in our 12th year now, 12 years. We've had to deal with a lot, quite a bit. All the trips up to Brooksville to get Swift Mud to give us the money and then dealing with DEP, changes in ways we had to to, you know, get rid of concentrate, having to deal with Henry Ross for I don't know how many years. But I'm proud to say that we're almost there at the finish line and it's gonna be well worth the wait, well worth the wait for us to be water independent to produce our own water. Back when this first came to us, I remember when it first came on in 04, April, 11 years ago, and that was one of the first things Ellen dropped on our desk. She had a big, member, that big old thick inch and a half feasibility, all the stuff that she was wanting us to go towards. And it was her vision and her prodding staff and getting everything moving forward that enabled us to be in this position now. Just look across the country to what California is going through. <laughs> Water, <laughs> through the years, people have taken advantage of its abundance, but not realizing its importance. When you're thirsty out in the desert, you'll give a whole pound of gold for some water. You can't live off of gold. Two things you need to live by, besides food in the long term, but short term, air and water. So at this time again, I would ask the board to think about it when this plant does come online and we go to efficiently ribbon cut it. Even though I had my differences with Ellen, I still think that it would be the right thing to do to name this facility after her. Because it was her original vision and her doggedness and her on staff to keep pushing all the agencies and then the people who came behind to continue that, we're going to be in a good position. And God rest your soul, this would be a good way uh, to honor her. But I do want to thank Bob and Paul and all of the staff for all they've gone through over the years to bring this project to completion because future generations in Tarpon will laud this effort. Thank you. There are, there are no other public comments. We'll go to our consent agenda. <coughs> uh, Attorney fees, Thompson, Sizemore, <coughs> Gonzalez here in LLP invoice number seven nine six four zero uh, nine is increased file number one five zero zero three eight C dash C M concrete batch mixed materials and <coughs> services ten approve additional services authorization uh, number one for bid number one four zero zero five zero dash B dash J J R O concentrate injection well. Um, Eleven is award bid number one five zero zero nine six dash B dash C M H uh, bank replacement for former police department building. Um, 
12 is a award bid number 150091-B-JJ Island Drive and Hill Street Storm Water Improvements. 13 is increased bid number 150021-B-RS purchase of 12500 uh, kilowatt uh, 3125 KVA tier 4 elf diesel generator with enclosure. Uh, 14 is increased file number 130102 CM saw material and services. Uh, Pinellas County contract number 123 0216 BKF. Uh, 16 is authorized uh, change order number 1. To Warden Smith Incorporated Construction Group for RP number 120086 uh, P JJ Design Bill of City of Tarpon Spring Alternative Water Supply Project. 16 is increased RFQ number 110068 S JJ Engineer of Record. And 17 is renewed file number 140076 C. DM purchase of sodium by sulfur. <coughs> uh, any item anyone would like further information? Seeing none, Chair would entertain a motion. <coughs> Move for approval. Second. Any public comments on any of these items? Roll call. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Commissioner Banther? Yes. Commissioner Terrapenny? Yes. Vice Mayor Larson? Yes. Mayor Archie? Yes. Special Consent Agenda, Ruckus Management System, Computer Aided uh, Dispatch. Heard a little. I don't know if you had any more to add, uh, Chief. Thank, thank you, Mayor. Um, like every other profession in our profession, technology is beginning to drive everything. And it's very important that we stay on the curve. It's very difficult to get ahead of the curve, but we really need to stay on the curve with technology. The CAD RMS system is, is the lifeline of the police departments. Um, record system, computer aided dispatch system, intelligence led policing system, the list just goes on and on and on. I've been in discussions over the last couple months, um, especially after coming back from the IACP conference, and I took a whole track that dealt with, you know, technology and police work. And, and it's so important as we move forward for agencies to share data. That, that's the key. To be your own island anymore is, is really not conducive to what we do. Um, the Pinellas County Sheriff's Department has a very advanced CAD RMS system. Um, they have TriTech for their CAD, ACES for their RMS system. Um, their system is superior to ours, hands down. In consultation with the sheriff, because um, this is government to government, we talked about you know what would it uh, you know what could it possibly cost, what would it entail for our department um, to integrate into your system. We would still be our own independent system, but now we'd have the ability to share our data with most every other agency in Pinellas County, the state attorney's office, the sheriff's department. Um, as I lay out my memo to you, um, I mean, they even have the ARM system, which is the automated report management system, where officers call in reports. The amount of time to process a report is like half. It takes a workload <coughs> off our records division. I mean, the efficiencies and technology of this system go on and on. And because we're going government to government, um, he had his people work with our people for you know, a good period of time. And um, he quoted us to, for all the servers, for, for the integration, $257,452. That's a very, very good price um, for a system like this. They go well over half a million dollars for a full conversion like this. Um, some of the other big benefits to this is we will, now, we will now be integrated with the 911 system. Right now, when you call, if you're in Tarpon Springs, you have to call 911. You go down to County Central and you have to tell them your story. They're, they're punching all the data into CAD. And then after you tell your whole story, you get piped over to us via landline. And you got to tell your whole story again as we punch you into our CAD system. Um, although there could be interfaces with the system we have, being merged into his CAD system, it's a direct pipeline right to our PD. They see the call going in live. They already have an officer going to the call. They see all the notes. They see everything live. So when that person is transferred over, they already know most of the story. They know what's going on. We have units en route. Um, and, and I lay out a whole bunch of other advantages um, to, to going to a system like this. Um, the reason we're coming to you now, I think it's critical. We're going to need about a three to four month um, implementation period because as we get into the new fiscal year, our maintenance costs will be 
up with our new CAD, with our current CAD vendor, and that's, you know, $55,000, $60,000. So our goal is to implement this system, training, servers, all the software conversion, everything over the next three to four months, have this operational by September 30th, and we basically disconnect from our current CAD RMS provider, and we're fully integrated and live with the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office. Um, his maintenance costs are only 5000 more than ours. Um, the one thing I will ask for, if approved, that we, we spend up to $25,000 to do the ARM system. That's in the police budget, but that is a critical component. Um, when you could call in all your calls, you have professionals that do it. They do all the UCR work. They do everything. It takes a ton of work off our records division. And if you can go out to a burglary call and process a call, right now the average time to do paperwork would be 40 minutes on a call like that, maybe longer, and it would be half under the system. So there's a lot of benefits to this. Um, there's a big benefit to our agency, to our officers, and um, we kind of looked at funding the city manager and I, and obviously, you know, police impact money is, is specifically intended for projects such as this. We do have 150000 in that. We want to use all penny if we could avoid it. So the funding is uh, police impact, $150,000, local option sales tax, fund, penny money, $160,000. And um, Commissioner Terrapani did ask that question, well, you know, where's the other 52000 coming from? Right now, to merge into a system like this, right now our units, we're using a simple, and I know Commissioner Banther is really good with technology, we're using a simple Wi-Fi device that plugs into our laptops to try and, you know, get data back and forth and to try and track vehicles. Um, every other agency, when you go to a system like this, has a permanent fixed Wi-Fi GPS system in the car. You turn on the key, GPS comes on, Wi-Fi comes on. Um, right now, we will be able to merge into the county-wide GPS system with our vehicles. Wherever they go, they're tracked. Um, it's a big benefit because we could see deputies, they could see us, we could see every officer in the county. Um, but that project right now I'm working with purchasing on um, so we can get a bid, but you know it's going to be in that fifty thousand dollar range. Do all of our police vehicles, and that's all transferable from vehicle to vehicle when we phase them out. So that's the overview of the project. I'll be you know glad to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Chief. Any uh, questions? No, I, I just think it's a great system, and uh, I'm glad to see that um, there's a. It's not just an upgrade that we're doing, but it's a. It's a. It's a. It's a. It's a direct benefit to our citizens by having a faster response time. And uh, so I think it's a great idea, and, and I'm glad that we can use uh, the, these funds we have, we have, we have, we have for that. So thank you. Any other questions? <coughs> Did uh, Chairman entertain a motion? Move motion. for approval. Second. Any public comments on this item? Roll call. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Commissioner Banther? Yes. Commissioner Terrapani? Yes. Vice Mayor Larson? Yes. Mayor Archie? Yes. Uh, settlement of administrative fine on lien 108 North Rain Avenue. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This request to settle a lien comes from the property owner at 108 North Rain Avenue. It emanates from liens imposed uh, in 2008 and from code enforcement violations accruing between March and September of 2008. Uh, the property was brought into compliance via demolition in 2008. That's why the uh, the total amount of the fine is only $14,208.65 uh, here some seven years later because of the, uh, the compliance and the no daily accruing fine. Uh, in July of 2013, the present property owner purchased the property and has been attempting since that time to sell it. Unfortunately, has been unable to do so due primarily to the presence of a sinkhole on the property. Uh, now the agent has found a willing buyer uh, who is apparently going to repair the sinkhole and develop the property. Uh, to that end, I have recommended that the city accept settlement of the $14,000 fine at the amount of $4,000 inclusive of the $625 in administrative costs. I recommend that the owner be given 60 days to pay that amount. If that amount is not paid, then the liens revert to their original amount. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Any questions? Uh, the chair will entertain a motion. Move to settle for $4,000. Second. Roll call. Commissioner Sieberg? Yes. Commissioner Banther? Yes. Commissioner Terrapani? Yes. Vice Mayor Larson? Yes. Mayor Archie? Yes. Uh, audits and resolution ordinance 2015-07 uh, renaming of the public safety building, and this is the second reading. 
Ordinance 2015-07, an ordinance of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, renaming the Harry K. Singleton Jr. Public Safety Building, located at 444 South Huey Avenue, to the Harry K. Singletary Jr. and Officer Charles R. Kondik Jr. Public Safety Building and providing for an effective date as a second reading of Ordinance 2015-07 by title only. It was published in the Tampa Bay Times by title only on February 27 and April 10, 2015. Any other information? Uh, Mr. Mayor, Commission members, no new information for this item. Okay. If there are no other questions, Chair will entertain a motion. Move for approval. Second. Any public comments? Roll call. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Commissioner Banther? Yes. Mr. Terpani? Yes. Vice Mayor Larson? Yes. Mayor Archie? Yes. Ordinance 2015-08, application 1521, amendments to the Comprehensive Zoning and Land Development Code, uh, Article 9, Section 133-06, Tree Bank, second read. Ordinance 2015-08, an ordinance of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, amending Appendix A, Comprehensive Zoning and Land Development Code, Article 9, Section 133.06 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, to amend the permissible uses of funds in the tree bank and providing for an effective date. It's the second reading of Ordinance 2015-08 by title only. It was published in the Tampa Bay Times by title only on February 27 and March 27, 2015. Yes, sir. Anything new? Mr. Mayor, Commission members, no new information. There are no questions. Then Chair will entertain a motion. Move approval. Second. Second. Uh, any public comments? Roll call. Mr. Sieber? Yes. Mr. Banther? Yes. Mr. Tierpani? Yes. Vice Mayor Larson? Yes. Mayor Archie? Yes. Uh, item 22 is Ordinance 2015 11 Amendment to the Comprehensive Zone and Land Development Code, Article 9, Section. 133-02, circumstance in which private property owners may be relieved from payment for the removal of or replanting of trees in the right of way. Second read. Ordinance 2015-11, Ordinance of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, amending Appendix A, Comprehensive Zoning and Land Development Code, Article 9, Section 133.02 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, to amend the circumstances in which private property owners may be relieved from payment for the removal or replanting of trees in city rights of way and providing for an effective date to second reading of Ordinance 2015-11 by title only was published in the Tampa Bay Times by title only on April 3 and 24, 2015. Yes, sir. Mayor, Commission members, nothing new to add. Nothing new, no questions. Chair will entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. Any public comments on this item? Roll call. Commissioner Sieber? Yes. Commissioner Banther? Yes. Commissioner Tierpani? Yes. Vice Mayor Larson? Yes. Mayor Archie? Yes. Our 23 is Ordinance 2015 12, Amendment to the Comprehensive Zoning and Land Development Code, Article 11, Section 191 01, Signage Accessory to the Sale of Gasoline. First reading. So ordinance 2015-12, an ordinance of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, amending Appendix A, Comprehensive Zoning and Land Development Code, Article 11, Section 191.01 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, to amend signage accessory to the sale of gasoline and providing for an effective dates. First reading of Ordinance 2015-12 by title only. Second reading will be held on May 19, 2015. Ordinance was published in the Tampa Bay Times by title only on April 3 and May will be published on May 8, 2015. Sir. Mr. Mayor, Commission members, uh, staff has received a couple requests to amend our signage related to uh, uh, signage for the pricing of fuel. Uh, currently, the Land Development Code requires fuel pricing to be a physical sign that is changed manually as the price of fuel is changed. Uh, the Land Development Code establishes the regulations for signage within the city. Uh, section 18901 permits one freestanding pole sign or monument sign, uh, monument sign per commercial property. A uh, parcel of land occupied by a single user uh, would be permitted between 32 and 100 square feet of sign area 
with that specific amount of signage depending on the size of the building or the size of the property. Section 19101 of the Land Development Code allows gas stations an additional sign to display the price of fuel. Uh, that sign <laughs> it can be a maximum of nine square feet. Uh, the purpose of the amendment is to allow the price of fuel to be displayed digitally. Currently, that is not allowed for uh, most commercial, for any commercial signage within the city. So first, one of the first things the amendment would do would be to propose to allow that fuel pricing to be displayed electronically. Uh, the second thing the amendment proposes to do is it would allow a gas station to allocate the, its sign area between advertising, the fuel pricing as such, because currently the fuel pricing sign, they would have an additional sign, uh, that's the nine square foot sign. Instead, they would be allowed, if they were allowed the maximum of 100 square feet, they could now allocate that between uh, an advertising sign, a fuel pricing sign, it would be up to the developer owner how they would like to display the information. And again, the ordinance currently allows one at fuel pricing sign per street frontage. So if a gas station was on a corner, they would be allowed two signs. And again, with this amendment, they would be allowed potentially a gas station on a corner, potentially three signs. They could allow, but they would be a fixed allocation. The developer, the owner would be, have the flexibility to allocate that signage how they would deem fit. But again, they're capped to the maximum allowed by the land development code. Uh, the Planning and Zoning Board, they heard this item on April 20th, 2015. Uh, the board supported this amendment and they did unanimously recommend approval. Uh, staff is recommending approval of ordinance 2015-12. Uh, with that, Mr. Mayor, it concludes my presentation. I'm available for any questions. Any questions? Mr. Sarbanian. Thank you. Does this amendment have any impact um, on signage on sign for uh, gas stations within the CRA? Mr. Commission members, it would be, the only difference would be in historical areas, the allocation of signage is smaller, but it would, they would be allowed to use an electronic display. Was there any discussion about that uh, in the Planning and Zoning Board meeting? No, sir. Thank you. Uh, I just want to get clarification. I know you were discussing the idea of multiple signs. If well, this is part C. It says a gas gasoline service station with frontage on two or more streets shall be allowed an additional 25 square feet of freestanding sign area, in addition to the signage allowed. So, is there more than one digital sign, or is it one digital sign and then there's additional other signs? Mr. Mayor, Commission members, the ordinance currently allows. Uh, one fuel pricing sign per street frontage. Uh, that isn't changing in, in terms of this amendment. Um, so if a gas station was on a corner, they could get two fuel pricing signs. And they would, they would both be digital? Yes, sir. Or they would at least be allowed to be digital? Yes, sir. But the only digital aspect would be the gas prices? That is correct. Only the pricing information can be displayed digitally. That is it. They can't advertise what they sell inside. They, you know, it, it's not about anything other than the price of gasoline. That is correct. It's only the price. There is no other. It cannot be a display for products or anything like that. It is just the pricing portion of the sign is a digital display. Thank you. I know this because, you know, they always change the price so fast that they don't want to have to go outside. <laughs> Uh, Chairman, entertain a motion. A motion uh, to approve. Is there a reluctant second? Second. Any public comments?
Here at Alex 514 Ashland Avenue. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Larson, for picking up on that particular point, and I didn't read all the language to see if it's really clarified because I know a lot of business people probably here, they can now use a digital sign. We'll put up a sign and complain to code enforcement later. Oh, well, I thought I We went through this, what, a couple years ago when <clears throat> the hospital wanted the uh, flashing electronic sign and one change in we talked about time lags and pretty much Mr. Yakovone at the time said it was only for specific defined businesses or entities and yet now as we move forward into the electronic digital world we now find other entities wanting the same aspect. I don't, bl I don't doubt them. I don't blame them. But I just think if you are going to craft language <clears throat> where you're going to allow electronic digital display that uh, if there's any doubts in your minds that you put it in the language in the ordinance so there's no doubt in the business people's minds uh, the type of electronic display uh, that they can put out. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments? Good evening, Mayor, Commissioners. Katie Cole, law firm of Hillward Henderson, 311 Park Place, Suite 240, Clearwater. Uh, I represent Racetrack and have been before this commission and the Planning and Zoning Board and worked with the TRC on a site plan approval at the intersection of US 19. <clears throat> and uh, Racetrack is one of the gas station owners who came to the city to request some e lightening of the restriction with respect to the reader boards. Uh, based on your inquiry, Commissioner Larson, Section E of the proposed ordinance specifically says that the signs advertising the price of gasoline may be constructed to utilize an electronic reader board to identify the current price of fuel being sold. So it very clearly restricts only the sale of gasoline provision. Uh, uniquely, the city of Tarpon had an entire provision in its code regarding the sale of gasoline. So when I first started working with Mr. Healy and then Mr. Kareccia regarding this request, it was, um, it, it was not uh, difficult for the staff to come up with a proposal that would advance the city to a position that would allow these electronic changing of the prices, as the mayor commented, they change quite regularly without opening Pandora's box or creating a situation that a lot of other businesses um, and the town's aesthetics may be impacted. Uh, with respect to Commissioner Terrapani's uh, inquiry, the total amount of signage on the site is only negligibly, negligibly being increased by that 25 square feet. So the total amount of signage isn't going to be impacted significantly county or citywide at all. It is the total amount of signage that could be uh, bifurcated between perhaps the large identification sign versus the gas signs. So there's really not a addition of signage. It's just a matter of allocating the signage to the gas prices and to the logo of the gas station or identifying the gas station. So we truly appreciate uh, the staff's help and, uh, and advancing this uh, on behalf of all of the gas station owners in the city and recognizing the need for some of these changes and uh, did go to the P and Z board, and they didn't address, as uh, the staff already spoke, the historic uh, aspect of the city. However, the code already has a chart that, rec that restricts signage in the historic dif district, different from the balance of the city to address those concerns. So we appreciate your consideration and respectfully request your approval of this. Thank you. Any other public comments? We have a uh, place there. May I ask a couple additional questions? Yes. Thank you. Um, I, I guess 
directed, the first one anyway, would be directed to our city attorney. Uh, I did read Part E, uh, where it says the signs advertising the price of gasoline may be constructed to utilize an electronic reader board to identify the current price of fuel being sold. And, and I understand the intent of, of that language. I'm wondering whether or not, I, I would like to hear your expertise, whether or not it would be beneficial to add anything a little bit more restrictive, whether or not inserting the word only somewhere in that sentence would be beneficial uh, to make it very clear what the purpose is of, uh, of, of this section. I appreciate that, Mr. Vice Mayor. Be because that code section is, is directly, uh, directly addresses signs accessory to the sale of gasoline only, I think the only is implied. I don't know that there's, I'm certainly happy to add the language at, at your direction, though I, I think it's probably, um, it doesn't address, the whole section doesn't address anything else. It's clear the way it's written. It is. Okay. Uh, and then my other question, um, and I'm not sure who wants to answer this, but I'm, I'm just trying to understand. Uh, I, I fully understand the, the need or, or at least the desire to go digital, and that makes a lot of sense to me. It isn't clear to me why there would be an increase of the additional 25 feet of signage. Um, what, what, what is the rationale for increasing the, the square footage for signage? Mr. Mayor, Commission members, the intent behind the increase was, and the assumption is a gas station site that would be allowed the maximum of 100 square feet of signage for a freestanding pole or monument sign. The code also allowed fuel pricing signs at nine square feet. So again, using the assumption of a corner, they could be looking, which most gas stations we were finding usually want a corner lot. That would be nine plus nine, 18 square feet. So, so just by code today, they could have signage of 118 square feet. Uh, generally, we looked at now a gas station, same assumptions, what could they do on the site? So we came up with 125 square feet as the maximum. Basically, the 100 that the code allows for the pole sign or monument sign, and then the additional square, 25 square feet if they had an additional frontage. So basically, we were looking at in a situation where corner lot could be given 118 square feet, so let's not, let's keep that incentive, I guess, or allowance for additional signage for fuel price advertising and go with the 125 square feet. So we looked at it as a negligible increase over the 118, but it did allow the fuel station owner to have signage, large enough signage for the fuel pricing. The, the 118 already had fuel pricing, it just wasn't digital. Yes, sir, correct. So now we're moving from 118 to 125 and we're allowing it to be digital, which isn't a particularly large difference, so I don't need to spend too much additional time on this. I'm just still trying to understand what the motivation was to increase from the 118 to the 125. Is, is the thought that the digital is harder to read and needs to be larger? Mr. Mayor, Commissioner, there was, we didn't look at it from that sense in terms of the digital versus uh, a static character. Um, we looked at it just in terms of if it was a standard gas station site, one street frontage, it'd be given 100, 100 square feet. We looked at a number that generally would work with the code. Um, 25 square feet seemed to be an increment that staff could work with. It was, um, I guess, an easy number to administer in the future. So if we had a single frontage, 100 square feet, if we had Two frontages now, we have 125 square feet. Thank you. Any additional questions? We have a motion right here. Roll call. Commissioner Siever? Yes. Commissioner Banther? Yes. Commissioner Terrapani? Yes. Vice Mayor Larson? Yes. Mayor Archie? Yes. And that concludes our agenda. Um, Chief? No comments, Mayor. The attorney. No, sir. To the bathroom. Just want to remind everybody one last time, if you could look at the tentative budget schedule and make sure there's no con con conflicts with vacations or 
plans and stuff. Not that if something changes, we can change it later, but if you just take one more look at that, um, if you need it again, I'll send it to you. Okay, could, you um, could you please do that? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just send it to everybody again to look at, and if they see anything that they know now would be a conflict, let me know. Again, if something comes up, you know, then we can always adjust on, the, on there, but I want to kind of finalize that for uh, the plans that you have for right now. So I'll get that out to you tomorrow. And uh, again, anything you see as a conflict, let me know. Thank you. Madam Clerk. Commissioner Balfour. No comments. Vice Mayor. No comments, thank you. Commissioner Tarpani. Yes, sir. Commissioner no Sibber. comments, thank you. Let me see. Uh, it's only 8.50, 7.56. You want to hang around a little while? Oh, <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, we'll adjourn this meeting at uh, 7.56 and three quarters. <laughs>